All right, so hello everyone and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. So this webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, which serves a global membership of computing professionals and students. So my name is Natasha Crooks. I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley in less than sunny California right now, where I work at the intersection between distributed systems and databases with a specific focus on decentralized trust. I'm also an SEM member. So before we start, I just want to give you a little bit of background for those of you who uh, may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer. So briefly, here's some, some information. So usually ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. So our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing. And there's a range of ACM learning centers to achieve that, learning center resources to achieve that at learning.acm.org. And we'll place that in the chat. And you can already see some highlights uh, on this in your screen. So ACM really recognizes that the role of computing is fundamental in driving innovations and in sustaining competitive in a global environment. So it provides a number of things. It provides access to the ACM Digital Library, which is the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature. Um, it organizes leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. It also supports education research, which includes curriculum development, teacher training. Um, it organizes the ACM Turing Award um, and a number of ACM prizes in computing. It's also um, at its core has an ACM code of ethics, which is a collection of principles and guidelines which are designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. So broadly speaking, basically, ACM enables us to solve critical problems using new technologies that will, we believe, enrich our lives, the lives of others, and advance society in the digital age. So before we get started with Luca Popa's talk, I just want to mention a few housekeeping technical details, and I think they're gonna be signed um, on the slide in front of you. So if you have any questions at any time, please type them using Zoom's Q&A feature, so specifically not in the chat, and I'll organize the questions as Luca speaks, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of the talk, and we'll try and leave a decent amount of time for questions because we'd like this to be as interactive as possible. The session is also being recorded and will be archived, and you'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And again, you should feel free to check learning.acm.org for updates on this or in general for other upcoming webcasts. And finally, at the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. We'd really appreciate it if you could take a minute to fill it out uh, to help improve our tech talks in the future. All right, so let's get started to the um, fun part of the, the webinar. Today's presentation is going to be Secure Computation in Practice by Ruluka Adapoka. So Ruluka is the Robert E. and Beverly A. Brooks Associate Professor of Computer Science at Berkeley. She works in computer security, computer systems, and applied cryptography. She's a co-founder and co-director of the, both the RISE Lab and the Skylab at Berkeley a co-founder and president of Opaque Systems, which is a new um, startup sort of working in privacy preserving computation, a co-founder of Prevail, um, which is also a cybersecurity startup and a little bit older. She's also the uh, recipient of the 2021 ACM Grace Murray Hopper Award, a Sloan Foundation Fellowship Award, many J. Lepro Best Papers, um, including the, so many Best Paper Awards, including the J. Lepro Best Paper Award at OSDI, she also has received the Jim and Donna Gray Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award, the NSF Career Award. She's a 35 under 35 um, Innovator MIT recipient, received a Microsoft Faculty Fellowship. And if that wasn't enough, she started young because she got the um, George Prowse Award for Best MIT uh, CS Doctoral Thesis. And I feel very privileged to be her colleague. So without further ado, Maluka, take it away. Thanks so much, Natasha. Thank you for the very nice introduction and thank you for staying up late and waking up early for me. Really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, all right, so I'm going to start playing. So I trust that everybody is seeing my screen and um, I'm very excited to be here, even if virtually, and tell you about something that uh, myself and my students have been working on for a very long time namely how to bring secure computation in practice. 
And it's really nice to see so many of you from so many parts of the world. That's, that's great. Um, all right. So the problem we are trying to solve is one that you are all very familiar with. There's a ton of compromises to servers that we hear about in the news, seemingly always breaking a larger and larger amount of data. And, you know, it's, it's not novelty anymore. We're all familiar with them. But the question is, why don't they stop? Why haven't our security mechanisms managed to create a significant dent and reduce their number or really, you know, um, prevent them from being such a notorious occurrence? And the reason is that traditional security, the way we have it today, is insufficient and it's weak. It fundamentally aggregates a lot of sensitive data at the server or a cloud. Let's take clouds as an example here. And the data is available at that cloud. So that's the fundamental issue. It's available. So if somebody breaks in, they can get to all that juicy amount of data. So the way they protect it is through building taller and taller software walls around it. The software always has bugs that will eventually be exploited by an attacker to get access to the data. Right? So to solve fundamentally this problem, ideally, this data is not available there. But to not make it available, one thing that you could use is to encrypt it. Right? If it's encrypted, just to kind of um, mention this for, you know, for a general audience, what encryption does, it basically encodes the data, it basically jumbles it like garbage. So if the attacker looks at it, it looks like garbage. Even if the data is stored in the server because it's encrypted, it's jumbled and not visible to the attacker. Now, importantly, the key with which this encoding happens has to not be available to the attacker. If that's the case, then this encoding, this encryption, the attacker is not going to learn anything about the data content. So now you might say, wait a minute, aren't we already using encryption in industry a bunch? And yes, we are, but we need to understand how we use it and take a look at how we use it because it's actually insufficient. So here are the primary ways that companies today use encryption. So let's say we have a data analyst that's making queries and response to some data in the cloud that's being processed in the cloud. The problem is that this data analyst you know, has sensitive queries and responses and there's sensitive data in the cloud, okay. Now, one type of encryption that is used in industry today is encryption in transit. So on the network, between the data analyst and the cloud, the data is encrypted, check mark. Now, if we look at the cloud in storage, at rest, the data is encrypted. What this means is that, for example, on the disks, it's stored encrypted while not, it's not being used. And so if an attacker were to break in, and steal the dis disks and run away with them, they just have encrypted data, jumbled data, so they wouldn't be able to figure out what the data is. So that's check. But what happens to data in news? There's no encryption there, and that's where the attacker is gonna break in. There's no encryption when the data is used, when the data is being processed on, analyzed, or you run machine learning, or you reformat it, or you access it then it's not encrypted. Then it's available in plain text, plain text meaning unencrypted form, just regular readable form. And that's when the attacker is breaking in and that's when the attacker is stealing the data. Even if you have encryption in transit and encryption rest, if encryption is in use is not used, then the attacker breaks in. And this is the state of dark for much, much of the systems today. Instead, we also want to have encryption in news. We also want the data to be encrypted during the computation so that we can have it encrypted throughout the whole pipeline. And ideally, we don't want this key to decrypt the data to be accessible somewhere that the attacker can get to. So we'd like to keep the data encrypted during processing and during compute, because even if the attacker attacks then it's encrypted. So then it's super nice because look at this whole pipeline on the network cloud storage and back, it's encrypted. So whatever this attacker attacks in this process, the data is encrypted. So that would be really, really strong. And a lot of the attackers today, attacks today 
would not have been possible with such a setup. Okay, but how do we compute an encrypted data? Right, that's what we need to make this happen. And the reason it hasn't been used so far is because it's hard to compute an encrypted data. Encrypted data is jumbled up, it's garbage looking. How can you compute with it? And this has been a um, goal of researchers, academics, and industry people for many decades, ever since Rivest, Adam, and Rattuzas proposed this concept in 78. We didn't necessarily have a construction. And then decades later, we had some early construction to, thanks to Gentry 2009. And since then, there's lots of different technologies that have been, have been providing more and more uh, opportunities. But there still isn't a very good solution. And the problem is that there's trade-offs between the existing solutions, but only now today we're starting to kind of shape up a way to do or multiple ways to do secure computation in practice that can be practical. However, there isn't a winner that wins all. So here are two prominent ways to do secure computation. So one is through cryptography, like cryptographic computation like FHE and MPC. And the other is through hardware enclaves. I will explain what each one of them is only at the high level. I won't have the chance to go in depth, but at the high level enough to be able to reason about what they offer and tell you the trade-offs between them. So my students and I have done a lot of research in both of these directions. And the reason is that, as I mentioned, there's a trade-off. So there isn't really one that wins all or no use cases. It really depends on the application setting, which one to use. So I'll give you a high level sense of each one of these technologies and their trade-off. So let's start with the cryptographic computation. So you might have heard of fully homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation. Both of them compute with um, the fact that the encryption can enable certain algorithms to run, but they have a different setup. With FHE, uh, you have these data analysts um, own some data, let's say, or have access to some data. And then in the cloud, you have the encrypted data. The analyst can send the queries to the cloud. There could be some other helping information, but anyways, the queries. The cloud can compute only encrypted data thanks to the algorithms of fully homomorphic encryption, produce an encrypted result and send it back to the analyst. The analyst has the key to decrypt the data and see the result, but the cloud never has the key to decrypt the data. Now, the other setting of secure multi-party computation is you have multiple parties, like the name suggests, and each party has their own data. For example, let's say we have multiple banks who want to track criminals like fraud, uh, fraud, money laundering. These criminals hide their traces across different banks and the banks really want to put together their data to see you know, who does a loop of transactions and so forth to catch them. But the banks can't share data with each other. So what happens with secure multi-party computation or, or MPC is that each party encrypts their data and they have their own key, a separate key. And they encrypt this data and they end up exchanging data and processing, doing some computations and transformations on it based on the MPC protocol. And this is something I want to go into how it works. There's a lot, it takes, you know, it will take a bunch of time, but you can just think that it manipulates the encrypted data and they interact a bunch at the end, they obtain some encrypted result, which could be the encryption of the suspicious accounts. Then they each use their key together to decrypt that result and only that result. So in the process, no party saw each other data other than the final result. And this is very, very powerful, like FHE. Okay, so where are we with this at the high level? There's been a ton of algorithmic improvement over the years. I remember the early scheme of Gentry 2009. It was estimated that you need, um, you know, it's a billion times slower than regular computation, a billion times. So it was really not practical. Of course, it was a beautiful new, new concept and a first step. But since then, we've done a lot of improvements over the years in research. And to a large extent, those improvements kind of plateaued by now. We're still left with three to six orders of magnitude slowdown, depending on the setting, depending on what computation you're doing. 
Um, some people say that with hardware and systems improvements, it could get to 10x, 100x. In terms of the amount of compute and resources that you put, it's still very, very expensive. So you can use it for simple kind of computations, but not for rich analytics, rich machine learning, and for a lot of data. It's really for very simple and specific tasks. And if you want to do that, um, then there are some very nice libraries that are available for you to use. The libraries for FHE, and they support generic functions. And there's libraries for MPC, and they support generic functions too. My students and I, what we've tried to do is, because we noticed that um, the progress, the slowdown still remains a bunch, and the progress started plateauing, we have been designing a bunch of specialized algorithms. Because if you specialize, you specialize the MPC, then you get a much more efficient protocol, but for a special uh, computation. For example, in Helen, we have efficient linear regression training on encrypted data. In news, we have efficient neural network prediction inference on encrypted data, and in Delphi, the same. Then the other thing that we observed is that, look, we've been designing all this crypto, but we haven't, for, for the systems today, but we haven't designed the systems for the crypto. And so in a bunch of work, we've been designing query planners. So if you have database computation with encrypted data, query planners that understand the constraints of encrypted data and can do a much faster job. Or managing memory, because memory blows up with MPC very fast. And then your MPC protocol basically freezes. And modeling and basic uh, protocols, so we know which one is faster in which setting. So these have brought about savings of 10 to 100x, depending on the setting. But I would say that even with this, and like hardware support through our work on Piranha and GPU support, but I would say that even with this, they're still you know, primarily useful for simple computations. So now the question is, which one to use between FHE and MPC? Well, it depends on a few things. So um, the system setup is quite different, as I showed you. And with FHE, you can outsource computation to a cloud, where with MPC, you need to have these different parties that um, each have an ability to do processing of MPC at their, at their clouds or in separate clouds and different trust domains, that's important. But because if they, everything in the same trust domain, MPC doesn't give you any guarantees. But if you have that setting, then MPC is much more performant than FHE. And it's easier to provide malicious security. So by malicious security, what I mean is that even if the attacker tries to run a different protocol and deviate from the protocol, modify data, drop data, give you old data, change the computation, even then you have security, which with FHE you don't have. With FHE, if the attacker looks at the data, they can't tell what it is, but they can actually make you compute something else, which could have many different implications on, on security. So again, which one to choose between them depends a lot on this trade-off, but I do find that in practice, MPC tends to be more performant. Now, <clears throat> how about the other approach, hardware and claims? Hardware enclaves have also been, I would say, trusted execution environments, of which hardware enclaves is a type of, have also been in the works for decades. And I would say in the past bunch of years, we've reached a design that we feel much better about, and it's much more, more, more promising. Starting with the Intel SGX world, NTDX, SCV, Nitro enclaves, a bunch of different enclaves in industry, and then in academia, enclaves like Keystone and I6, which provide even cleaner guarantees. So what enclaves do is they basically create a hardware-enforced isolated execution environment. So in this picture on the cloud, I'm showing you one simplified server. The server has a die. It's like a processor, and the processor is under a die that's tamper-proof. And inside that die, you have your regular cores for computation, a cache, and whatnot. But then with enclaves, you also have an encryption engine, the ME. And this ME has a key fused in. So now every data that exits the processor gets encrypted with the key. So in memory, you only have encrypted data. 
Now, if somebody tries to reach under this die and get access to the key, it's not known how to do it. It's, it's tamper proof. It's supposed to be a government level attack in magnitude. And it's supposed to, if you try to open up that die to lose the secrets, the secrets are gonna, you know, are gonna be lost. Okay, so the attacker won't be able to get access to the key. Okay, now the nice thing is that all the data in memory is encrypted. And so long as you have a hacker that breaks in, the hacker, you know, remotely, they're gonna look in memory, right? They can't really physically attack the hardware. And even that's supposed to be you know, very hard to open up that dice, temper proof. But in, the memory is encrypted. And the other thing that Antrix have that's very nice is something called remote attestation. So basically, the analyst can check what code is running on the remote enclave and that that enclave is a legitimate enclave certified by a hardware vendor they trust, whether that's Intel or AMD or whatever they trust, and by the cloud they trust. So it's really nice that remotely the data analyst can make sure what code this enclave is running and make sure it's not running anything else like malware or who knows what. At the end of that, using remote attestation, the data analyst can create a secure channel with the enclave and send the key. So let's say that this data analyst encrypts their data with their own key, and then it can send this key to the enclave so that the enclave can decrypt the data and process on it. Okay, so inside the enclave, you will have decrypted data, but outside of it, it will be encrypted. Okay, so let's take a look more in a slightly more detail what happens between the processor on the die and the memory. Data goes out encrypted, okay, because of this key. Every data coming out of the processor is encrypted. So the attacker, the attacker is not inside the processor, the attacker is outside of the processor. The attacker can only see encrypted data. Now, you, when you load data from memory, it's again loaded in encrypted form, but this ME can decrypt it and give it in encrypted form to the core, the processor. So this is nice for two reasons. One, the attacker thinks that it's computing on encrypted data, the processor, because it sees encrypted data in, encrypted data out, encrypted data in, encrypted data out, doesn't know what the data is. At the same time, the core runs at processor speeds because it's running with regular data. So boom, you have performance too, okay? So you have performance and you have the illusion of computing on encrypted data from the perspective of the attacker. Now, there are some concerns with enclaves and I would say the primary one is side channels. So there's a number of side channels, but let me categorize it into two that I find. I find there's two um, major categories really. So one is, side channels based on the memory addresses based on the fact that memory is outside of the enclave i mentioned that the data is encrypted in memory but not the addresses so the attacker can look and see there's a store at address 100 of this data the data is garbage is encrypted but it sees which addresses are accessed and the pattern of access of addresses can leak information so here's an example let's say your program is the following application program. If the patient's disease is COVID, it's going to load data, read data from two consecutive uh, addresses in memory. It's encrypted data, yes, but the addresses are consecutive. If the, it's not COVID, it's going to read from one place in memory and the different place in memory, not consecutive. Now, this attacker doesn't see what the data is, but the attacker can see, let's say, when Alice goes to the doctor, if there's two consecutive reads, loads, or separate. If they're consecutive, the attacker knows it's COVID. Okay, so from this pattern of access to memory, there's memory side channels. And there's a ton of attacks that came out that are exploiting these addresses and showing that you can even retrieve entire documents, for example, if you run a spell check on the enclave. Now, there's also side channels that are different from the memory ones. They're more like implementation side channels because of course this enclave is, you know, sometimes bugs were more rather because it's put on a complex system already, a complex architecture. It maybe didn't think of something or another, didn't foresee some things. 
Um, and, and these are things like memory corruption or transient execution and things like this. So what can we do about these side channels? In the first category, um, many times these are patched as soon as discovered, especially if you use an enclave on a major cloud, which is what I recommend, because there, for example, Microsoft Azure is going to patch the enclaves as soon as possible. Now, the other side of enclaves are harder to protect against. And let me tell you that I think these are not the enclaves responsibility. These are the applications responsibility. When these attacks came out, they pointed out uh, you know, breaking the enclave, but I don't, the enclaves were clearly saying this is not in their threat model. It's not their responsibility because the memory is outside of the enclave. It is the application's responsibility to protect itself by accessing memory in a way that does not reveal sensitive information. Okay. So let me talk a bit more about this. A lot of our work in the hardware enclave space has been about mitigating these memory side channels because this is something that doesn't get patched right instantly and immediately because it's more fundamental. Um, and actually, we found that by combining with some cryptography, and I'll tell you what kind of cryptography this hardware enclave approach, we can achieve really nice protection against all the memory side channels and get some sort of hybrid between these two that's really nice. So the approach is called oblivious computation. I'll tell you in a moment what it is at the high level, but it's nice because it's like one ring to rule them all out. Fundamentally, it ensures that the memory addresses accessed don't reveal about the data anything. There's no such thing as consecutive pattern. It all looks random or it all looks the same no matter what you access. And because of that, all these side channels, whether they're exploiting the memory addresses to the cache or to the branch predictor, or to the memory bus or to the paging attacks, it doesn't matter, they all collapse. Okay. Okay, so here's an example of an oblivious, uh, oblivious version of the little program we had. When the patient accesses, is, when the patient disease is COVID, you make two random accesses. If it's not COVID, you also make two random accesses. So the attacker is not going to learn anything from the access, whether it's COVID or not, it's not going to learn anymore. So this is the idea of oblivious computation that you need to make accesses in a way that does not reveal the data. As an analogy, I like to give OpenSSL. When we implemented AES in OpenSSL, we made sure that the way memory is accessed, the timing and whatnot is resistant to side channels. The same thing we have to do for code that we put inside enclaves, whether it's machine learning code, analytics code, or whatnot, right? Or web applications. This is what we need to do to protect against those side channels. So my students and I have done a lot of work and research into these oblivious um, systems uh, for enclaves. And the reason is that it's actually challenging to be efficient when you do such oblivious computation. If you think about it, um, you know, in the worst case, you could just scan the whole data for every request. It's going to be oblivious, but that's very slow. And there's been a bunch of really nice work from other people on oblivious algorithms. And what we did is we try to develop systems that are oblivious, for example, doing SQL analytics with enclaves in an oblivious way, doing distributed analytics with OCQ, doing point queries and search with obliques, ML inference with biaser decision trees, and security boost, and recently scalable storage is Snoopy, it actually is co-authored with Natasha here in the call. So if you do that, if you use oblivious computation, I think that on the major cloud, you get some very nice security from a secure computation with enclaves and performance and efficiency. Why? You now have two, two layers of security. So you have defense in depth. One layer is the cloud traditional security. So Google, uh, Azure, AWS, they have very strong state of the art security mechanisms. I mean, they implement it at various levels. They try to do the state of the art mechanisms. Of course, nothing is ever perfect. This is not going to be perfect, right? There's still going to be bugs, but it's about, you know, security is economics. How hard is it, right? 
And many times these clouds are stronger than, you know, a cloud that somebody would just create on on-prem, right? Because they have a lot of expertise. And that's one layer. And now if you add a complementary layer, the enclaves, and you have this enclave encryption of memory, enclaves also have authentication of what they compute with the remote attestation, and you have oblivious computation for the side channels, you get two layers of security, which together are very strong. I'm not aware today of any attack that manages to subvert both at the same time, right? Because the attacker needs to subvert both as part of the same attack. If you cannot subvert one, it's not going to get to the data. It needs to subvert both. Okay. So on a major public cloud, enclaves in, comp in combination can be a really nice defense in depth mechanism. You manage to break in state of the art, let's say, security of the, of the cloud, and still the data is encrypted memory by the enclave. Okay. So that's kind of the intuition. Of course, no security is ever perfect, right? But this is a very strong defense in depth. And you have the performance of the enclaves. So I think that this is actually a very, very promising direction. Okay, so let's kind of summarize a trade-off between these two mechanisms. And really the question is when to use each one of them. Besides efficiency and security, there is a number of other trade-offs I kind of alluded to like setup and whatnot. But in terms of efficiency, just to really, really summarize at the high level, the cryptographic computation via MPC or FHE is suitable for simple computations, but if you have a specialized computation, for example, with MPC, it could be quite fast and you can, uh, you know, you can use it in practice. If you have complex workloads like training, um, you know, complex machine learning algorithms or rich data analytics, it's going to be too slow. Today, it's too slow, way too slow. In terms of security, it's nice because confidential data is never decrypted to the servers, not even in a hardware. Now, the hardware enclaves can support efficiently complex workloads. You, you have the efficiency you need, and you can really run a lot of you know, rich analytics. Whoever is familiar with the standard benchmarks like TPCD, STPCH, super complex and heavy queries, they can run efficiently with hardware enclaves. Um, in terms of security, from the perspective of the you know, ha hacker, the attacker, memory is encrypted. It, it's encrypted, it's never decrypted in memory. But as I mentioned, it can be vulnerable to side channels. Now, if you use defense in depth using uh, oblivious computation and you go on a major cloud, so you have oblivious computation and on a major cloud, then I think you really mitigate the lot of concern and you really have a very nice, pragmatically speaking, defense in depth solution against side channel attacks. Okay, so now when to use which one? I cannot tell you for every single setting. But what I hope to do is I hope to kind of give you a sense of the trade-offs so that when you are faced with a use case, maybe it's clear which one of them to go to. Although, you know, sometimes it's a gray line between the two, but sometimes it's more clear. Let me give you some examples. Let's say you have multiple parties that have some secrets and they want to do uh, averaging of their secrets. Um, in that case, I would use MPC. Why? Well, it's already decentralized the setup in multiple parties. Averaging is something MPC can do very fast. You don't need specialized hardware like enclaves. You don't need um, you know, to, to worry about you know, hardware vendors and whatnot. You really just can use MPC for that. If you instead want to do complex data analytics and machine learning training, you just can't use MPC. It's just too slow. And the hardware enclaves provide an efficient solution with a really nice defense in depth, again, on a major cloud. All right, so I told you about our various research at the high level. And, but you know, I'm a strong believer that if we want our research to be used, we have to go all the way to transform it into a real easy to use product. I don't believe that by having a paper on the shelf is gonna get work, is gonna get that much adoption. It's very rare in systems and security that someone, somebody picks up your paper and implements it and you know, incorporates it and adopts it. It happens sometimes, but it's very rare. Really, the person who developed this research and then knows it intimately should kind of package it in a way that the world can consume, that non-experts can consume and really understand its benefits. And that means a real, easy to use product. 
So my students and I, many, many of them are believers in pushing, and I'm a strong believer in pushing our research into open source. So we have created the MC squared open source project, which you, which you can check out at this GitHub link. And in this project, um, by the way, it stands for multi-party confidential computing, MC squared. Anyways, it's a pun on the energy formula. But uh, this um, link can actually play with both the cryptographic approach and the hardware and layer approach. Now, um, some projects are exploratory, they're just research prototypes, but others are actually actively maintained and uh, can be used in production. So the GitHub explains which ones are which, but the high level confidential analytics and machine learning with enclaves is something that's actively maintained and can be even used uh, in a product. So uh, I want to say that this uh, MC Square project has had some early adoption in a number of use cases of different companies. Uh, and it's had some really, really nice collaborations and got some really nice feedback and you know, um, managed to improve it based on the feedback of real world usage. And so feel free to check out our open source. Feel free to you know, ask us questions. If you run into problems, build on it, contribute to it. Um, yeah, play with it. Okay. Um, so I want to tell you uh, another uh, way in which you can use the open source. Um, and in general, secure computation. It's not just to um, you know, make sure that your data is protected in the cloud. No, it can actually also enable collaboration between parties that cannot share data with each other. So let me give you an example of how you use the square pipeline for multiple parties with the enclaves. Let's say we have three banks and they have uh, customer transaction data and they want to find cycles of transactions because usually money launderers you know, send money in cycles. And by themselves, they can't find those cycles because they look at their transaction, there's no cycle, it looks like it's fine. But the banks don't want to share data with each other. So what they're going to do is they're going to use the MC squared platform in the cloud. I have an enclave here. And each one of them is going to first do the remote attestation. The remote attestation is going to check that MC squared is really running on a legitimate enclave on the cloud that they desire. They're really going to check the setup to make sure it's correct. And this can be done with a simple software. You don't have to worry about it. It's all done transparently. The user doesn't have to worry about this. Once they did a remote attestation, they can set up a secure channel with the inside of the enclave and send their keys inside of the enclave. Again, the keys are not visible to the machine. They're not visible in memory of that machine. If an administrator looks into memory, it's encrypted. If an attacker breaks in, it's encrypted. They're only deep inside the hardware. Okay, but now, because of this, they can send their encrypted data to the enclave and the enclave can decrypt it and can now compute the cycles and see if there is fraudulent accounts and then obtain some results and send it back to all of them. But uh, many times you need more than one machine, right? You need the cluster. So in, with MC squared, you can actually um, scale out to a cluster of machines that he each have enclaves. This primary enclave is going to attest them. So this primary enclave is going to check their setup correctly. And it's going to set up secure channels that it sends the, the required keys and data so they can process all like virtually like a huge enclave. And then you can benefit from scale out as well. So you don't have to be confined to a single machine. Okay. Um, then, um, I actually will probably have to plug in my laptop, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just gonna do that in a moment. I'm really sorry about that uh, oversight. Okay.
Okay, I'm back with new fuel. <laughs> I hope this gave you also a second to chew on all the stuff I'm throwing at you. Um, but basically, now that you have this scale out computation, uh, it produces the final result encrypted and it sends it to the different parties, encrypted for each party, and each party can decrypt it. Okay, so basically, what I showed you here is how you can actually collaborate with um, data that parties cannot share with each other. None of them is going to see it. The cloud is not going to see it. The hacker, the attacker is not going to see it. And the very nice thing is that they were able to detect, let's say, cycles. So maybe they just uh, get to see the suspicious accounts, but nothing else, none of their other proprietary information. OK, so I want to say that when we were building this open source, uh, we were very privileged to have a number of industry partners as part of our lab, the RISE lab, and now into the new lab, the Sky Lab. But it was interesting that a bunch of them were naturally requesting us for features like um, graphical user interface, enterprise ready tools, things that are not rewarded in research. And again, I'm a big believer that to really get your technology adapted, you really have to make it frictionless. So part of this, a few of my students that graduated myself, like the company opaque around it, that's packaging and supporting the product that's easy to use and enterprise ready. And these are the three students that are working on it and say myself and a colleague. So basically taking MC squared and giving all the tools that people need. So you don't have friction, it's enterprise ready, you have graphical user interface, 24 seven support and whatnot. All right, so I'm going to wrap up now. And uh, basically the conclusion of this talk is that we need encryption in use. To really make a dent on the never ending attacks we have today, we need encryption in use. So basically we need to be able to compute with data or process data while keeping it encrypted. And these are two ways of doing it, the cryptographic computation approach and the hardware run curve approach. And they have different trade-offs that make them fit for different use cases. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up the talk and kind of uh, finish with a very bold prediction. I really think that secure computation or industry sometimes call it confidential computing, will be the primary way to compute from confidential data in the cloud within the next decade. And I do believe that's gonna be an exponential curve of adoption and that has already begun. Why am I saying this given that for decades there wasn't really much adoption of secure computation? Why am I saying this? First, for the reason that I mentioned that we actually have a solution right now in the cloud the hardware run clay plus state of their security, the depends on that, that's actually quite nice. It's very nice and efficient. You can actually be efficient and frictionlessly run workloads that people have today without even the user having to have any security expertise. They can just use one of these platforms, for example, NC squared, and they, they don't necessarily need to have uh, expertise. The other reason I'm saying is that major cloud providers are providing the hardware enclaves infrastructure now. Before you had to acquire the enclave, set up a cloud uh, on-prem cluster of enclaves. It was just a lot of work and maintenance. But now they're available in the cloud, and that's a huge thing. Also, Gartner. Um, those of you who know Gartner is a top industry uh, consultant company that surveys um, industry for trends. They basically estimate that by 2025. 60% of large organizations will adopt privacy enhancing computation for processing data in trusted environments like conflicts and multi party data analytics use cases. I think it's a very exciting time for secure computation. I really think that, you know, the exponential adoption curve has begun. All right. So that was it. Hopefully, you learned some things about how. Um, you know, to do secure computation and how, you know, think about it in practice. Here's the open source if you want to play with it, learn, try it out, work with it, I know, give us feedback, yell at us, or uh, tell us nice things, whichever way you want. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, Ruluka, uh, please imagine tons of uh, virtual clapping uh, for the great <laughs> talk. Um, Thank so you. it seems like our questions are Go, are centered around a better understanding the um, properties and the security of enclaves and some of the trade-offs in um, MPC and fully homomorphic encryption. 
So I'm just going to start with enclaves briefly. So the first question is, haven't all enclaves been broken? And what about foreshadow that doesn't necessarily target you know, side channels, but actually attestation? Yeah, yeah, very, very good question. Very good question. Um, so uh, that's the reason I, um, I emphasize and I believe the defense in depth. If you have, for example, an enclave and um, you don't use it in a major cloud, right? Let's say you have it. I've seen some people propose usage of them for blockchain applications on the user's machine where the whole consensus lies on their security. I wouldn't trust them. Why? Because yes, there are side channels that even beyond memory attacks um, for shadow, you know, you can call it a side channel or not. Um, there are implementation bugs like that. Um, now they're getting patched very fast, but they still can be nuanced. Completely agree. So that's why, you know, just relying on the non-existence of, of those is not something that you want to do because there's always going to be some bug for them. Even look at OpenSSL, open right? Is the default, um, you know, library we're using for encryption and TLS. It's still getting broken, but, you know, rarely. Uh, and we're still the whole world uses it and hardens it. But my point is to use enclaves in the cloud as a defense in depth. You have state-of-the-art cloud security. You have a trustworthy cloud that's well intended, wants to protect you from hackers. Then you have the enclaves. You have oblivious computations, so don't worry about memory issues. And you have the cloud patch as fast as possible these bugs. Now, for that, I haven't seen any single attack so far. Why? Because you need to understand this is an important point. The attacker needs to attack both at the same time, both as part of the same attack. It's not enough to just attack the enclaves, it has to attack state of the art cloud security. It's not enough to just attack the state of the art cloud security. We have to attack the enclave. A lot of the attacks that have happened are in extremely controlled environments. On a user's machine where there's no state of the art cloud security, there's no such protection, just the user does anything they want with the enclave. And that's where they're more exposed. But in the major cloud that quickly patches anything like foreshadow, that on top of that has state of the art cloud security. It requires breaking both of these mechanisms in the same attack, and that I have not seen an attack for. There might at some point be, like with everything, right? But it's much, much harder, right? And it's all about economics, how hard of a target is it? And I think it's quite a difficult target. So it was a really good question. There were a number of questions that um, asked about key management. So specifically, um, there were, um, Someone asked whether the same keys were used for data that's um, in flight and um, stored uh, um, at rest. And other people asked about, broadly speaking, um, if you um, control the server, the attacker controls the server, um, do they not also control the keys, the authentication keys, and thus have the ability of uh, treating them as uh, legitimate? Oh no, the data. So basically, to summarize, how do you do key management, and how does it um, in the context of hardware enclaves? Yeah, yeah, those are very, very good questions. So for the first question as to the, whether the keys the same or different, normally you use different keys for different protocols, and you just try to use different keys as much as possible. It's just a much safer. Uh, it, it's a principle that we, you know, when we design security uh, systems, we use. So in transit, you have a set of keys as part of, you know, the TLS protocol and the station protocol. In, for storage at rest, you have some other keys. Um, during the computation, you have other keys. So in general, you try to have different keys. Why? Because if one key gets uh, hacked for some reason, uh, the effect of the attack should be minimal. So now the second question was, if the attacker controls the cloud, can they get access to these keys? So the idea is that these keys are inside the enclave. And the attacker can't see what's inside the enclave. The hacker cannot see what's inside the enclave. Now that here, our threat model, our attacker is not the cloud. We actually want to use a major cloud provider, somebody that's, you know, a trusted, trustworthy company that, you know, if Google, Amazon or Microsoft would become malicious, I think lots of other problems would be in the world, right? But in general, they're you know, well intended. They're trying to give the strongest security guarantees and whatnot. So the keys are inside the enclaves inside the trustworthy cloud. So it's not, they're not reachable to the attacker. Now, if an attacker breaks in, they're very hard to get. 
I'm not saying it's not it's not possible. Nothing in security is impossible. That's the problem with security. But it's all about economics, like how hard is it? And it would be very, very hard for the attacker to break through all these layers to get to the different keys. Okay, and so yeah. There were a couple of questions on MC2 specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the questions asked how efficient is MC2 uh, compared with other approaches, MC2 squared. Um, and second question, what secure hardware does MC Square support? And I'll tag along something to that, which is related to another question that got asked, which is how specific was the design of MC Squared to a, a particular enclave? And so how, when you design a system like MC Squared, how much do you have to tune it or how much do you have to design the protocols specific to a particular enclave or is it general? Yeah, very, all very good questions, by the way, really good questions. Um, so in terms of how efficient is MC Square, so MC Square right now is a repository of different uh, projects, research projects that we've done. So efficiency varies across them. Some of them are in the NPC space, um, some of them are in the hardware landscape space, some of them are very fast, so they have, you know, 10% overhead, others are pretty heavy. Um, MPC, malicious security, whatnot, can even get to a thousand or 10x, a hundred, a thousand. It really depends on the on the setting. So I would say because it's 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 a bunch of research projects. Now, if you look at the one that's actively maintained, right? Um, the analytics and the machine learning with enclaves. Performance again depends on the workload, but can be anywhere from 10% to 2x, or it could go higher. But I would say most workloads will probably be under the 2x performance. Now the question is what hardware enclave is MC squared built on? That's a very good question. So um, we were lucky actually that Intel had given us access to the Intel SGX enclaves few years before they were commercially available as part of our collaborating with our lab. So a lot of MC squared is built on that. That was the main available enclave. Uh, but right now we have efforts in trying to also offer um, a CV uh, from AMD on, on Google Cloud and nitro enclave so trying to be enclave agnostic now a lot of our projects are by design enclave agnostic but obviously the implementation is uh, currently tied to an enclave it's tied to intel sgx but as i said we have efforts to try to diversify the enclaves and as more and better enclaves appear we also try to support them that's why we actually implemented against the open enclave sdk so that it's not tied to sgx uh, Open Enclave SDK is basically a standard that many enclaves abide to, not all, but many. So we implemented it in that standard, so we don't actually, so we're not actually tied to SGX. So just as a final question related, to, okay, two final questions related to hardware. So one, um, to, to follow up on this, are you ever limited by um, the functionalities of the hardware in terms of, for example, Cryptographic primitives that they um, offer, or standard libraries that they offer, or is that not how to think about enclaves? Um, yeah, I see. So the question is about the enclaves. So the enclaves um, are doing are having full functionality because they're it's just the cores, the usual cores, the usual CPU that's running on the pretty data inside the enclave. So they give you full functionality. Um, you didn't have, before you didn't have access for things like GPU or, you know, which you want to use for, let's say, deep learning, but even now they're available in preview very recently, so that's very exciting. So let's say enclaves are full functionality. Now on the cryptographic side, like uh, MPC, homomorphic encryption, there are some schemes that are not full functionality, and they, because sometimes people want to specialize the specific functionality to achieve better performance. But there's also libraries that are completely full functionality, like the one I um, cited on the slide, like Zama, Palisade, um, Liberty, and so forth. Cool. And so as a last hardware question, if you had to make a wish list to all the, the CPU vendors um, for secure computation in the next 20 years, what would that be? Yeah, that's a very, 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 very good question. I think that the big part of why there are so many, you know, exploits with enclaves is that they are put on a very complex, messy computer architecture that itself has, you know, specter-like and speculative execution attacks and whatnot. So I would say thinking about uh, simplifying 
for the sake of the enclaves, for the sake of the secure computation. I know it's not a simple thing to say, but 10 years is a good amount of time maybe. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that cleaning up an architecture, and it's not, we said academics have shown ways to do that. Academics have proposed enclaves that are much cleaner in design. Now there's gonna be a performance overhead, of course, but I think many times, you know, depending on the performance overhead, it might be worth it for confidential workload, right? It's not necessarily your average workload. So I really think that looking into that is, um, is, 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 is very important. Um, I do believe that enclaves are here to stay. We're just seeing improvement and improvement and improvements, and they're really very, very efficient compared to MPC. So I do believe they're here to stay. They just still need, you know, iterations and iterations and iterations. And I think, yeah, effort in that direction, taking you know some of the designs academics proposed would really help. So maybe a couple of final questions on MPC specifically as you bring it up. So um, one of the things that uh, people uh, remarked is that the citations that you made about MPC were very much from the 90s. Um, and so I guess the two questions are, are those still the state of the art? And if not, given the state of development in the last 20 years, what is the efficiency? Um, what is the uh, yeah the efficiency difference with between MPC and enclaves? And do you ever see that getting yeah. narrower as we continue developing new algorithmic tools? Yeah, yeah, great question. So the citations that they're referring to from the nineties are those that are it was actually seventy two thousand nine are um, the foundational ones. I put them next to the secure multiparty computation FHE name kind of. They are the ones that created the concept in the original scheme. So we academics attribute them to kind of starting out the direction and really, you know, making some seminal works. But besides this, I actually cited by name a number of systems that are the state of the art in MPC and FHE. So I mentioned libraries like Zama, Libeci, Palisade. Those are state of the art for FHE. I mentioned libraries for MPC like MP Speeds. AGMPC, AG2 MPC, those are state of the art for MPC. And those are much, much, much faster than those original works by far, but those still remain orders of magnitude slower than regular computation. It could be anywhere from three, you know, orders of magnitude, sometimes six orders of magnitude, sometimes people say 100x. It really depends on the workload. With hardware acceleration, you can make them faster, but they're still heavy, but much faster indeed than the earlier ones. Thank you. And I guess as a final question to leave us with a bleak future in mind, um, what do we do if it's the cloud provider that's uh, malicious? And I'll conclude with that. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? If, if the cloud provider is not on your side, I would say that hardware enclaves are not ready for that threat model. Now, there's still things like MPC right you probably need three clouds or you know because mpc is across multiple parties and then malicious mpc and in that case if the cloud provider is malicious it's okay it's protected right you won't be able to run very complex workloads not now um fhe also protects against the malicious against the uh, cloud but not necessarily malicious um, modification of things you might need to combine things like zero knowledge proof or MPC mechanisms and whatnot. So basically, if the cloud provider is malicious, you have fewer options with more limitations, but you still have some for some use cases. Great. So I'm glad that you're uh, finishing the talk on this hopeful note, because I'm afraid that we've uh, run out of time today. So I really want to thank Luca for this amazing presentation, all the insightful answers, and for all of you who asked many insightful questions, and I'm sorry that we didn't get to ask uh, all of them. So thank, thank you again. Okay. Thank so, you so much. The questions were very, very good, actually. It, it sounds like you guys are researchers as well. If, if maybe if you're not, then you really sound like it. And Natasha, thank you so much. Uh, and the ACM for Oxygen for the organization as well. All right. So uh, just to summarize, again, this talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org, which I believe is uh, flashing um, on your screen right now. And there's many announcements on all the upcoming talks at ACM organizers and other ACM activities. And as Veluca said, it seems like um, you already know uh, 
a large amount of our secure computation, but there's many um, other topics uh, that may be of interest. Um, so final note, please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics, future speakers, um, how would you like to change this format? And so it should, um, you should see it on your screen in, in just a moment. So again, on behalf of the ACM, Raluca and myself, thank you again for joining us at the many strange times in which uh, you might have done based on the locations that you mentioned. And I really hope that you'll join us again in the future. So thank you again and um, have a great rest of the evening, day um, or morning. Thank you. Bye-bye.